Good morning, everybody. Welcome to this beautiful spring morning. We have a really interesting talk today, and it's very, very timely with tick season right around the corner as things warm up. Dr. Tao Li, who's very well known to us for his work in allergy, and also he works with the medical students and teaches um, bioinformatics uh, with Dr. Rabelais and, and Kim and uh, we, we, we see and hear his name all the time, and he's brought us a wonderful speaker today that he is going to introduce so we can get on with this uh, talk about Suddenly Meatless. Very good. Thank you, Dr. Kruger, for the, the kind introduction. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll jump right into the introduction with, with my friend and colleague, uh, Dr. Scott uh, Commons. Uh, you know, we're really delighted to have him here. Uh, Dr. Commons has been part of the faculty of the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill since 2015. Jealous because UNC is still dancing and we're not. Uh, uh, he's currently an associate professor of medicine and pediatrics there. Uh, he is a member of the UNC Food Allergy Initiative and the Thurston Research Center. Uh, Dr. Commons maintains uh, you know, a, an active clinical practice and research program related to the topic he'll be talking about, which is uh, alpha-gal mammalian and meat allergy. Uh, as part of his training, he, uh, he received an MD PhD uh, from the Medical University of South Carolina in Charleston, which I'll be visiting uh, next month. Uh, and uh, following his uh, internal medicine residency, uh, Scott completed a fellowship in allergy immunology at the University of Virginia, where he trained under uh, Tom Platts Mills, a, a mentor to many of us. Uh, Dr. Commons is a member of the um, American Academy of Allergy, Asthma and Immunology, and was recently uh, a member of the congressionally appointed Tick-Borne uh, uh, Disease Working Group, where he was co-chair of the Alpha-Gal Syndrome and a public comment subcommittee. So uh, welcome, Scott. Uh, uh, glad to have you here. Thank you all. I appreciate the, the kind introductions and the opportunity to be here. So it's, you know, it's always a challenge, um, I think, during, during Department of Medicine Grand Rounds to make it make it interesting to everyone um, from various divisions. So what I, what I plan to do today, hopefully, is to, to try to accomplish that and um, teach a little bit about uh, this alpha-gal story. Here are my disclosures. I don't think these are relevant uh, for the topic today, although on UpToDate, I do write the, the topic card for uh, meat allergy. So if there's a conflict there, uh, I'll acknowledge that. Um, and I always like to start with the, the scientific contributors because my sense is we save this for the end and, and these folks get short shrift. But, but really, we all know that it takes a village to do science. So I, I, um, I want to lead with these folks and really call out uh, Shalesh Chowdhury uh, Dr. Chowdhury runs my my lab operation and is kind of the the brains and hands behind a lot of this research. So going back to the mid 2000s, I was at the University of Virginia, as Dr. Lee mentioned, um, in in allergy immunology training, and then uh, later as a junior faculty member. And we became aware at that time of, of two distinct forms of anaphylaxis. This was happening in the lab of Dr. Platts Mills, who is uh, certainly legendary in the field of allergy and immunology. Um, and without a doubt, we, you know, we all stand on the shoulders of those that go before us and, and a tremendous amount of, of uh, work has been done by Dr. Platts Mills. Um, overall in allergy, but equally in this in this story as well. So he was my mentor at the time. Um, and the first form of anaphylaxis was allergic reactions to a medication called cetuximab. It's marketed under the name Herbitux. It's an epidermal growth factor receptor uh, inhibitor used in uh, the oncology world. These reactions to cetuximab were immediate. They were consistent. So each time you infused it, a patient would react. And they were regional, oddly. Um, in fact, this was a, 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 a picture taken from an August 2007 uh, JCO article um, that reported a high incidence of cetuximab-related infusion reactions 
in Tennessee and North Carolina and an association with the atopic history. Um, these were not subtle reactions. They, uh, cetuximab is given IV and, and patients would show signs of, of allergic reactions within, a, within minutes uh, into their infusion. But what was striking was certain, certainly this regional nature to the cetuximab-induced anaphylaxis. It wasn't being seen in Boston or California or in areas of Europe where um, the clinical trials had been done. We equally were aware of a handful of patients at that time who were telling us, you know, I think I'm allergic to beef and maybe pork is involved, maybe lamb is involved. And their story was strikingly different. The reactions were delayed. So they would say, you know, I eat a hamburger for dinner and, and literally nothing happens. And then I'll wake up at 1 a.m. with itching and hives and swelling. Um, but, you know, it doesn't happen every time. I might, I might eat a burger one and it would happen. And I would think, you know, beef is really bothering me. And then, I, I, you know, I might have a flank steak. And, and nothing happens. And so I think this is over with, and then I have some pork ribs, and I get hives and, and terrible abdominal distress. And equally, we were only aware of these patients in a regional way. And it turns out that uh, an IgE or allergic antibody response against a sugar, this galactose alpha-1,3 galactose, which we call alpha-gal for short, was in fact the cause of both the cetuximab anaphylaxis and these delayed allergic reactions to beef, pork, and lamb. So just a little bit more about alpha-gal. It's shown here next to the blood group B antigen, and it looks a tremendous amount like blood group B antigen in that they both have an alpha-1,3 linkage between two galactose moieties. Turns out blood group B antigen has an alpha-1,2 linked fucose, which separates it from alpha-gal. But all lower mammals have alpha-gal. We as humans don't. And this obviously becomes the crux of the story. So if you're allergic to alpha-gal, meaning you have an IgE antibody that recognizes that sugar, you then become allergic to anything that contains alpha-gal. Importantly for this story is the idea that you're now allergic to all forms of mammalian, non-primate mammalian meat. So, you know, you, you might say lower mammals, but essentially humans and the great apes do not have alpha-gal. Seems to be an evolutionary thing um, in the fossil record. We, we lost the ability to, to make alpha-gal uh, some years ago as a, as a post-translational glycosylation event. Um, but lower mammals retain that. So um, that's where the alpha-gal IgE um, delayed meat allergy tends to come from. So initially we thought this was an, an interesting, perhaps even fascinating um, observation, but in 2009 we only published two dozen patients. We had 19 from Central Virginia, and another five patients from the late Barrett Lewis's allergy clinic in Springfield, Missouri. So just 24 folks. And now here we are, you know, a little over a decade later, and we really wanted to have a sense of how many people were out there with this alpha-gal meat allergy. And so <clears throat> in partnership with the CDC and the main testing um, site, Viracor Eurofins, uh, we we wanted to go back and see how many tests has Viracor Eurofins done. They're they're essentially the national provider of alpha-gal IgE uh, immunoassay uh, lab testing. So any sera that gets sent through Quest or Mayo or LabCorp, all of that eventually makes its way to Viracor for the IgE testing. 
There are some sites, UNC is one, University of Virginia is another, where we do in-house alpha-gal testing. But outside of that, Viracore is the spot. Um, so I will also say before, we, before I show you the numbers, just because someone's had a test done does not necessarily mean that they have the allergy. There is a, a, an amount of false positiveness in the allergy field we refer to it as sensitization, but it simply means you test positive without clinical disease. Um, in this scenario, I think sensitization is probably fairly low because these are largely allergists who are sending blood uh, you know, as a send out test. So you probably have a suspicion that something could be going on. Um, but that is a caveat that we, we could have positives that don't actually equal um, disease. So. From 2010 to 2018, uh, Eurofins, Viracore Eurofins tested over 120,000 specimens for alpha-gal uh, allergy. Uh, that came from 105,000 people, and over 34,000 were positive. So this was way more than we ever anticipated. I, I frankly would have thought we had five or 6,000 positives uh, over that time period. but we have over 34,000 cases that we think we are now aware of in the US. And so then the question becomes, you know, where do these come from? And if you'll look uh, in, in the row for the South, um, there's a total of, of nearly 31,000 that were submitted. And of that, over 10,500 were positive. Um, Keep in mind that Eurofins is a referral site. So there is a portion of these where they have no idea where the, the blood sample is coming from. And that's captured on the last row there where you see there's over 19,000 positive and we aren't sure where those folks come from. If we, for the samples where we do know where they come from, either based on zip code or referring physician, you can see in the person's positive per 100,000, you can see an increase in the dark blue, um, particularly across the Southeast and the East. But equally now, as we get into 2018, spreading into the Midwestern portion of the country and even into Minnesota, Michigan um, area as well. So just a few minutes about the clinical presentation of what I will call alpha-gal syndrome or AGS. So these patients originally uh, were ones that we found who had true sort of allergy symptoms, right? They had itching, they, they noted hives, swelling, redness, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, may have, may have had a, a low blood pressure and described lightheadedness or dizziness, syncope even, anaphylaxis, right? And this is the folks who we were aware of in, in the mid-2000s and published in 2009. And they often would say the fattier the meat, the more severe their symptoms, but it seemed largely to be limited to, to beef, pork, and or lamb, maybe venison. But they often would tell us that they tolerated dairy. So they were okay with cheese pizza or ice cream. And that was essentially how we sort of saw this allergy. It turns out, I think that's just the tip of the iceberg. So the, the, this would be the, the original, if you will, clinical presentation. A 55-year-old woman awoken from sleep around 1 a.m. reporting itching of her palms. That becomes a big, uh, symptom, sign and symptom uh, in the original AGS group. And, and and they often have to do this when they tell you the story because it's such a, um, a, a profound sign and symptom. But she said her palms were red and swollen, turned on her bedside lamp and noted her body was covered in hives. Then she reported intense gastrointestinal cramping and collapsed on the way to the bathroom. The noise awakens her husband, he calls 911. And when you take a little bit more history, she notes that she had leg of lamb at a restaurant uh, for dinner earlier that evening and that they enjoyed a particularly good bottle of wine with dinner. So it turns out 
that alcohol and exercise are really important cofactors in sort of creating the risk for these reactions. It can happen without exercise and alcohol, but for some patients, it's almost exercise or alcohol dependent. And there are times when they can, they can eat a small amount of beef or pork, but if they drink or have uh, strenuous activity around that, they'll have, a, they'll have symptoms. So in the, in the sort of classic AGS original um, description, you know, we manage those patients by asking them to avoid mammalian meat, particularly fatty cuts. Ice cream is something we often have them avoid. Um, they occasionally are fine with dairy and cheese. I say occasionally most of the time. They're, they're okay with dairy. Uh, they can put cheese on their on their chicken or or salad, et cetera, and very few issues with gelatin, which can often be derived from mammals. We do talk a fair amount, as I mentioned, about exercise and alcohol creating a risk for these reactions, and we often monitor their blood test alpha gal IgE over time. Occasionally, they'll go negative. About 30% of my patients over a three to five year time horizon. Uh, if they can avoid additional tick bites, um, we'll have their blood test go negative. And then sometimes we'll even do a, a pork sausage challenge in the clinic to really assess whether they're fully negative um, or if they still need some avoidance. I just bring this um, to you because we're, as a, as a society, we're really good, I guess, at using the animals that we slaughter, the cows that we slaughter, um, in, in terms of their um, tissues and byproducts end up in a lot of things that are not uh, consumed by us. Um, they, may be, they may be consumed by us as general consumers, but not, not eaten. So the, the ramifications for having alpha-gal allergy or alpha-gal syndrome, I think this and the next slide really indicate why I like to call it a syndrome. It's not that these patients are all allergic to sheetrock. It's more that if you're allergic to mammalian-derived tissues, um, it, it can come up in and present in numerous um, places that might be quite unexpected. This is true of um, porcine-derived products as well. So we're very efficient at using um, tissues from these animals, and and this can become become an issue. You you know, if you have alpha-gal allergy, you can still have bone china, but you may not be able to eat marshmallows in the same way that you did before. So now. I just wanted to bring up um, a couple of the um, sort of ramifications of, of this in terms of other clinical presentations, because I think it's important for, for folks taking care of patients. And the second one that really came to our attention is this idea of, of essentially gastrointestinal only symptoms and signs. So these patients don't get hives. They could perhaps, but so far, many patients that have GI-only symptoms really don't have itching or swelling or angioedema. They don't have the typical things that would lead them to the allergist office. They often end up in the GI clinics, and their symptoms may not be quite as delayed, and they may be a little more difficult and nuanced um, to figure out because probably there's a portion of folks who, who get gastrointestinal cramping from eating a, a fatty hamburger. But I think there's a portion of those people, particularly where y'all live and where I live, that have GI symptoms because they have alpha-gal allergy, and we owe them a blood test to, let them, to help them figure out if perhaps the hamburger is the cause of their GI symptoms. So we published this um, in gastroenterology 
uh, it's um, sort of a, a combined case series, and, and uh, I think the title kind of says it all. Isolated gastrointestinal alpha-gal meat allergy is a cause for gastrointestinal distress without anaphylaxis. So in this group, nearly 88% of them, um, and this was 16 patients, had abdominal pain. They also report nausea, diarrhea. Um, it can be episodic or chronic. Um, and many of them met criteria for diarrhea predominant IBS. Um, so, and they're not easily diagnosed. So in our group, even in a place where we feel that our awareness is high for AGS, we still had nearly a two year uh, median time uh, from symptom onset to diagnosis. So I just encourage you to think about AGS in the GI clinic or when you see patients who have uh, recurrent, uh, especially evening abdominal pain. We've done some testing of pancreatic enzymes because these can be derived uh, particularly from, from porcine sources, so pig sources. Um, and we've seen patients who may have had their uh, pancreas removed for other reasons and are on pancreatic replacement enzymes end up with AGS and then start to be bothered and react to the pancreatic enzymes themselves. So this um, shows some skin testing that we performed in clinic. And the idea was if we could skin test and find a, a safer pancreatic enzyme, maybe we would choose that one. So in this scenario, we chose prion for this patient um, and avoided uh, viokinase and pertzyme as well as Zenpep. It may really be that geography matters. So in Denver, this may not be a big deal in the, in the GI clinic, but it may be throughout the South and in the East that this really is something we need to be paying attention to. From the cardiology perspective, one of the issues that came up that we were not aware of initially was patients having allergic reactions to um, bio, bio, um, bioprosthetic valve placement. Right, so these valves often come from bovine or porcine sources. And we had a patient with AGS who had anaphylaxis following a mitral valve, porcine mitral valve replacement. Admittedly kind of caught us off guard. We weren't thinking about that, um, but we now are. Um, and if you have these patients, I would encourage you just to mention it to them, maybe the first or second time you see them and say, look, if anyone ever wants to put a, a pig valve in you, we need to have a discussion. Um, it can be done, and we've done it safely, but, but we want the surgeons to be aware. We're also curious about whether AGS could be a risk factor for early valve failure. And this is something we're looking at with colleagues at, at Duke um, at the moment. We don't know how deep uh, the implications are, if it includes, you know, patches, and, um, and I mentioned valve failure as well. A potential solution um, for this quandary uh, could be the, um, these pigs that exist, which have their uh, galactose, their GGTA1 gene inactivated. So they're essentially a knockout for alpha-gal. They otherwise look like wild type pigs, but in some ways they're homologous to humans in that they don't make alpha-gal. And, and so these, uh, these pigs eventually could be a, a safe source of heart valves um, for patients with AGS. Equally, um, you've probably seen this headline, uh, in January, the first pig to human heart transplant. And if you read closely, this, the, the porcine heart came from one of these gal safe or alpha gal knockout pigs. Um, so potentially there are even larger ramifications um, beyond just AGS. So it was this patient did not have alpha gal syndrome. All of us happen to make uh, an antibody response to alpha gal. If you make an IgE based one, then you have AGS, but the 
uh, sort of natural antibody response to alpha-gal is the cause of hyperacute rejection. So it's been one of their causes, one of the reasons for xenotransplantation to not be um, viable. And it may be that the alpha-gal pig gets us around that to some extent. So more to come perhaps on that side of it. I think the biggest issue to me for patients with AGS in the cardiology space is how much heparin can they have? Can they have it safely? Um, we tend to find that a small amount of heparin is not a huge deal, but we've had people with alpha-gal syndrome have anaphylaxis during uh, cardiac cath, uh, when they have to go on bypass as well. So when you're pushing you know, multiple thousand units of heparin IV in a patient who has alpha-gal syndrome, I think there is a concern for anaphylaxis and one that at least needs to be discussed, even if the decision is we need heparin. Um, I think it's just good for the, for the care teams to really have that discussion. And then equally, we've recently been thinking about the immune response to alpha-gal, the link to red meat, and could this be part of atherosclerosis? So what I'm showing you here are images from an intravascular ultrasound, or IVUS, uh, with the, the fibrous and fibro fatty uh, plaques intensified. And in the alpha-gal IgE positive patient, we found that the, their unstable atheroma burden was higher. This was 118 patients who all presented for chest pain. They were not necessarily those who were screened or presenting for alpha-gal syndrome at all. And that's an important caveat, and, and I think dictates the way that we frame the next study, which is to say, these patients presented because of chest pain. They were not asked anything about their diet, hives, reactions, anaphylaxis, tick bites. We don't know that story. We just know that when we went back and screened the serum, that those who had alpha-gal IgE were more likely to have uh, IVUS, which showed an unstable, um, ultra, uh, an unstable plaque feature. From the endocrine perspective, um, armor thyroid comes up a fair amount for us. Um, I assume probably for everyone who has patients who wish to take a more natural uh, route on their thyroid hormone replacement. And we specifically um, ask patients not to do this if they have AGS because we've had people react to armor thyroid, which is derived from porcine thyroid glands. And on the renal side, um, within our alpha-gal cohort, we've seen proliferative glomerulonephritis uh, associated with uh, monoclonal uh, immune deposits. We've seen minimal change disease and nephrotic syndrome, FSGS. Interestingly, porcine kidneys have one of the highest concentrations of alpha-gal. Um, I'm, I'm not sure how that really affects um, care of human patients uh, who have renal disease, but it is curious to me that um, we have seen some, some renal pathology, perhaps at a higher rate than I would have anticipated uh, amongst our patients with AGS. And, and then um, more recently, in October um, 2021, you may have seen this headline where prior, so this is actually prior to the heart transplant from the GalSafe pig, um, surgeons at, at NYU attached a pig kidney, and that pig kidney was from the alpha-gal knockout pig as well to a human, uh, and it worked. So perhaps there is more to come with this idea of xenotransplantation and the AG knockout um, pigs. On the infectious disease side, I struggled a little bit um, to, to, to bring in alpha-gal syndrome but there's a really interesting line of literature related to the natural antibody response that all humans have and make against alpha-gal. So not, not the IgE one, but 
um, in some really interesting work, Miguel Suarez group has shown that if you augment the alpha gal IgE or sorry the the alpha gal IgM response um, in mice using a, a gut microbiota um, uh, e. coli version that that expresses more alpha gal so you raise the the mouse's uh, IgM these are alpha gal knockout mice um, you raise their IgM levels that recognize alpha gal uh, which is present um, in the um, uh, in malaria then you're able to prevent uh, or at least diminish um, plasmodium in uh, infection through mosquitoes. So antibody response to alpha gal seems, if you can increase it, seems to protect against malaria transmission. Um, ag agreed, doesn't have as much to do with the IgE side of it, but uh, just begins to show that alpha gal as a sugar is actually probably quite important uh, in, in health and disease. So we've actually seen um, a, a similar approach um, being tried to uh, protect against Chagas disease because there is, there's alpha-gal present um, uh, there as well. So an, an alpha-gal-based uh, glyco vaccine seems to prevent infectivity. Um, and uh, we've also seen this be, be published uh, for Leishmania as well. So we may, uh, in time, have vaccines that are um, that come to market to induce our uh, natural anti-gal, if you will, antibody expression. We just hope that they don't trigger uh, an IgE response as well. For rheumatologists in the audience, um, we do have patients with AGS who report joint pain, and it, it's acutely worsened if they eat red meat, and it improves on an avoidance diet. So at first we had I had trouble sort of reconciling that, but it turns out more recently there have been, um, there's this paper shown in 2019 where the, they actually did find mast cell activation uh, and mast cells present uh, in the joint space. So I think there is, um, there's real reason to believe that if you're allergic to something and you're eating it, and the allergy cells end up in your joint space, you may have, honest to goodness, joint pain that's attributable to your food allergy. So um, avoidance diet may have more ramifications than we initially thought. Equally in the rheumatology space, there are a few medications that are similar to uh, cetuximab uh, that I mentioned in the first slide where the cell line that's used to um, produce the, the um, recombinant um, molecules may glycosylate with alpha-gal, which was the case with cetuximab. It was made in a murine cell line, and that murine cell line heavily glycosylated cetuximab with alpha-gal. We've seen a little bit of glycosylation with uh, orensia um, and very few but occasional reactions to Remicade. They both contain quite low amounts of alpha-gal, but for some patients um, who have perhaps a high IgE level against alpha-gal, if you then give them Remicade or, or Rencia, they, they may develop some symptoms. So I would just use some caution there. So generally, the gelatin-based plasma expanders, gelofundin, gelofusine, hemocele, those are not common in the U.S. at all. But in Europe and Australia, those definitely have to be avoided in patients with AGS. Vaccine-wise, there are some that contain gelatin or other mammalian byproducts. In the U.S., we definitely do not like our patients to receive Zostavax 
with MMR, we have to be careful. Um, and Boostrix is our uh, the Tdap brand that tends to have um, potential for alpha gal. We've seen some reactions. There are other um, formulations for Tdap, namely Adacel, which are seems to be safe uh, for patients with HES. Uh, anti venom. I usually tell patients if you need anti venom, get it. Um, and we can deal with any allergic symptoms that may or may not happen down the road. But um, that Crofab does have does have alpha gal um, just based on you know the production side of that um, coming from from horses. So other products that contain gelatin, um, Surgiflow, Surgifoam powder, you know those things we just they don't bother everyone, so it's really sort of a case-by-case -case discussion. Um, gel foam can have alpha-gal. Gabapentin, um, the capsules um, definitely have a beef uh, gelatin there. The lidocaine patch we worry about. Various gummy supplements. Um, there have been some real issues with uh, vaginal suppositories. Um, and then uh, some collagen containing uh, agents as well, including certain implants uh, can be problematic. So a lot of that's very much case by case, uh, individual patient discussion with their, with their team. Now I wanted to shift a little bit here um, to talk about why we think this happens, right? It's a really interesting idea of this regional nature for two distinct forms of anaphylaxis, but why are people getting this? And it it turns out we actually think it's due to tick bites. Um, and I like this slide because uh, it, it illustrates how small the larval form of ticks can be. They can be exceedingly hard to see. They can look like a freckle uh, or a poppy seed on a bagel. Um, and I think they're often mistaken for chigger bites because they're incredibly small and they itch uh, like crazy and you can get multiple bites from these larval ticks at once. Um, in fact this uh, this picture here shows a a foot and ankle from, that have been has been bitten by larval tick bites and this was um, actually really a, a critical um, event in and figuring out the um, connection to tick bites uh, for the alpha-gal uh, story. And, and this, um, this research participant's um, blood had been tested in 2009 and found to be negative for alpha-gal uh, with a total IgE of almost 200. And then you see the photo is after hiking in August later that same year. Um, and that the um, participant had a reaction after eating lamb, and we rechecked his blood work in October, and his alpha gal was 48, and we checked it again in November, and it had gone up to 130. And um, his other blood tests, um, turkey, cockroach, dust mite, really didn't change. He was positive to various mammal, uh, such as cat or dog, and to and to various foods such as beef and pork, but it was not a it was not an immune response of everything. It was very clearly a mammalian limited um, immune response. So obviously this is not causality. Um, there probably were many other things that happened uh, to this person um, between May and October. But this, uh, this episode of larval tick bites was um, one that clearly he, he recalled um, and even took a picture of uh, because it was so striking. And, and that is one of the things that kind of began us uh, to think about, uh, gosh, could tick bites really do this? And so then we went back and at that point we had um, probably 125 or so patients enrolled in our, in our alpha-gal um, allergy cohort, and we went back and started asking them, you know, any chance you've had a history of tick bites or chigger bites, um, 
Admittedly, I wasn't so interested in chigger bites themselves, but more as a surrogate for those larval tick bites, which um, are often confused, particularly in the south and southeast. And, and you see here um, in the red triangles are patients who reported, uh, yes, I do have a history of tick bites or chigger bites. Um, a few patients I couldn't track down, that's the black triangles, and some people specifically denied it. Turns out that those ones shown in the black circles were patients that um, had a high total IgE and they end up having atopic dermatitis. So probably sensitized um, to alpha-gal per se, but not allergic. This is the kind of data that we would love to have, but it's a really difficult experiment to do. And that's where you have um, someone get tick bites and then you follow their blood test over time. So this patient came to us after having a bad episode following July 4th barbecue. Um, and we, so she saw us on July 10th, uh, about a week after her anaphylactic event. Uh, we, we checked her blood tests then. Her, her alpha-gal and total IgE are, are shown in blue and orange, respectively. So her alpha-gal IgE was positive. It was about um, a five or six. And then she gets about 50 tick bites from larval ticks while working in the garden over um, Labor Day that September. And she is kind enough to come back to clinic and give us serial samples uh, of blood every two weeks, and we could track a nice rise in her alpha-gal specific IgE and her total IgE in the weeks following that. Again, not causality doesn't prove it, but it really begins to uh, make an argument that perhaps tick bites can do this. Um, the other part of it is the geography. So this is uh, essentially crowdsourced data from um, what's called ZMAP. And these are patients who have self-identified, yes, I have alpha-gal allergy. So this is a, a recently downloaded map of the US of cases. There's probably about 5,000 cases in this um, ZMAP hosted website. Um, if we look at uh, Kentucky um, and surrounding region more specifically, you'll see um, that there are plenty of cases uh, in your area. If we look at the um, Lone Star Tick territory in the US, it seems to correspond fairly well with where we see cases, but also wanted to remind you that alpha-gal syndrome um, is a global issue. So we have colleagues in Europe and um, Scandinavia, Australia, South Africa, who equally report cases. It's, there are different ticks in these spaces, but um, but tick bites in each of the populations um, does seem to correlate in general. So different ticks in, um, in Australia, but the same allergy. This is equally true in Sweden. So reports of uh, the red meat allergy there. This is interesting data from a Japanese group uh, showing that with uh, increasing number of tick bites reported on the x-axis that the alpha-gal IgE shown on the y-axis tends to rise. And the ticks that they have there are also amblyoma, which we have in the US. Um, our lone star ticks are amblyoma americanum. Their ticks in Japan are amblyoma testunarium. This is a up close, um, picture of the tick mouth parts. The idea is just to show you that these, the way that they bite and attach is they kind of saw in through the tissue. And I think that that's probably really important because it, it creates danger and inflammatory signals um, in a way that may be much greater than the small tick itself. So they may be able to do a lot of tissue damage just by the way they attach. They use these um, cement cones in order to really attach themselves. And there may be some antigen even in the cement cone shown there uh, on the right. This, I just want you to be aware that 
um, it's a two way street. When ticks attach to us or dogs or deer, they are taking blood, but they are pushing into the host um, salivary factors, tick factors. So <clears throat> it's not just a one way street. And there are things that the tick could um, push in that may increase the allergic inflammation at the site uh, of the bite. And one thing that comes up from time to time is, you know, a lot of people get tick bites, but why doesn't everyone end up with uh, AGS? We, we're starting to think that part of the answer lies in this idea of um, tick resistance. It's not really been described in humans, but it has definitely been described in animal models. And it may be that there are some humans who equally develop uh, the ability to uh, have tick resistance. In, in, in hamsters and mice, it seems like this is mediated by basophils, shown there in the middle. Um, we're not sure exactly which cells may mediate this uh, in humans, but, but we think this actually could be part of why not everyone develops the allergic response. Obviously, it's a difficult set of experiments to do. That is to ask volunteers to put ticks on themselves, let them feed, and see what happens. Um, that's really not where we think the science is going. We realize we can't do that experiment. So we thought the next best experiment to try to do to really understand could ticks actually create a risk for this alpha-gal allergy is to use the the mouse model that doesn't have alpha-gal. So they kind of resemble humans in that sense. They're because we're we're alpha-gal deficient. So are these alpha-gal knockout mice. With our colleague Shahid Karim, we um, inject the mice with tick salivary gland extract that's shown in the gray arrows on the left. Um, and when we do that over a period of about uh, four, four to five weeks, there's a rise in the alpha-gal specific IgE following tick salivary gland extract that's shown in the blue, um, the blue squares on the left. When we then feed those sensitized mice with pork kidney, remember I mentioned earlier that pig kidney has an incredible amount of alpha-gal. When we homogenize and feed these tick sensitized mice pork kidney, we see their body temperature fall. That's shown in the green triangles on the right. It turns out in, in animal models of food allergy, that's how we measure um, for anaphylaxis, is um, a, a decreasing core body temperature. They also have some behavioral changes, but the real discrete data is by taking their core body temperature, we take it with a rectal thermometer. But in those mice that are sensitized and then fed pork kidney, um, we see their body, body temperature fall. In the mice that are just fed pork kidney that are not sensitized to tick extract, we don't see a big change. That's shown in the, in the red squares on the right. And the PBS challenged mice that have been sensitized with tick extract, that's the PBS S group shown in the blue circles, they don't seem to be reacting either. When we then take kidneys from the pigs that don't have alpha-gal and essentially repeat that same experiment, that's shown on the right now juxtaposed to the, the graph from the prior slide on the left. But if you're looking on the right, the gal-safe pork kidney homogenate, the PKH, in the tick sensitized mice seems to do nothing, whereas the wild type pork kidney again causes a decrease in the core body temperature. So we really think that tick, that this set of experiments shows that not only can tick extract sensitize these alpha gal knockout mice, but it seems like within the pork kidney, what's really important for causing the risk for the allergic reaction is the alpha gal itself. So, um, this is just a sense of like our current research um, 
and future direction, sort of where we're headed. Um, I think I'll stop here and take any questions. Um, I'm happy to talk through all this, but um, I wanted to make sure we leave time for questions. Um, this is a great summary slide. Um, this appeared in the New England Journal um, in 2021 um, about alpha-gal syndrome. So if you if you have interest in a in a you know fairly timely review article, this is a good one. Um, but thank you for your attention, and I'll be happy to take any questions. So Scott, I always start out because, especially when I am, ex am extremely excited about a talk, you get my vote for this is the most uh, important talk for me this year. Um, as a gastroenterologist and the residents that work with me know, I'm one of the only ones that even check for food allergies. A lot of times the commercial food allergy um, panels are IgG. And so I think uh, that's why a lot of times people say that doesn't mean anything. I think it probably does. If I have somebody have IgG positive for something, I will then put them through an elimination trial. And I've got a lot of people who, quote, had IBS diarrhea predominant even for like 18 years. I had one lady tell me she hadn't had a solid stool in 18 years until she stopped. I think it was soy and uh, something else for her. But the alpha-gal um, uh, commercial labs, I mean, we're just beginning to start to really start to, to send off and use it and try to determine, as you mentioned, sometimes the titers are high. My question for you, because should we be sending this all the time in our patients? <laughs> With, I mean, it would be, for me, it would be probably every third or fourth patient um, I, I know the ones that have the itching and the, and the hypotension that you reported, those, those are very prominent. But what about just the uh, diarrhea predominant and the joint pain? How, how much should we be looking for this to, to try to um, really uh, see if it correlates with our patient's common GI symptoms? Yeah, I know it's a great question. I appreciate, appreciate your kind words. Um, so, you know, I think we probably need to be sending it more than we are, honestly, at the at the moment. But I think you're right; it's not everyone. Um, a lot of a lot of patients um, we see in the in the GI clinic have low titer IgE. So I would tell you another important point is um, it's a the the I think the alpha gal test is a little bit like a pregnancy test where um, it's either yes or no. I don't. I'm not worried about. Oh well, it's low, so you don't. You can't really have it. I don't think that's true. I think if the shoe fits and it's 0.8, you then probably need to do an avoidance diet. Um, and and we do this sometimes where we test it and people test positive and we do an avoidance diet and they're not better. And then I say, look, you know, let's move on. It wasn't. This wasn't the thing for you. But I always like to look for patients who. Um, episodically, their 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 gastrointestinal pain is worse at night. Um, can wake them out of sleep, but I think sometimes you need that outdoor history too, which is probably something we're not used to asking. You know, how do you spend your free time? What do you do at work? Do you have a history of tick or chigger bites? And if you kind of get a series of yeses there, I think that's who you check it in. Um, joint pain is tough. I think. Um, I wish I had a better answer for you on that. I think we tend to do it um, in patients where they just spend a tremendous amount of time outside and their tick bite history is so robust, um, we end up checking alpha-gal for them too. I guess I wanna know if you believe, other than avoidance in any of the therapies, there was a recent publication about auricular um, acupuncture uh, be, uh, and, uh, and so besides avoidance, um, and since there are fluctuations, you did, you did point that out too, and then even people developing a resistance, do we know of any preventative strategies that, that you believe in? I think the, to me, one of the biggest prevention strategies, once it hap once it happens is 
getting the permethrin treated clothing, particularly the socks, that seems okay. to be a big thing. Um, there's a company called Insect Shield that makes these socks that so many of my hunters and outdoorsy folks swear by to help prevent additional tick bites. Um, you know, the ear treatment is out there. I don't know that it's ever been sort of, you know, double blind placebo controlled. Uh, my concern, honestly, is not that if it works great, uh, then I want to learn to do it. But the allergy itself is inconsistent. And I worry that yeah. you could get your ear done and think you're cured. And we, you know, so that to me is a, is a, is a spot of concern. All right, Dr. Commons, I think uh, Dr. Kruger's something might have glitched on her there for a second. But uh, if anyone else has any questions for Dr. Uh, Dr. Commons, you can uh, unmute and ask, or if you want to, uh, you can type it in the chat area as well, and we can read it for him. So, uh, uh, Dr. Lee, did you have anything you would like to like to um, ask Dr. Commons? Sure, uh, Scott, a fantastic uh, talk. And again, I just want to ask my colleagues, if you have any questions, feel free to drop in the chat uh, or, or on microphone. Uh, you right. know, one, of the, one of the challenges we often have with uh, patients in the Kentucky area, you know, who come to us with, you know, uh, AGS is, you know, can I ever eat meat again? Can you talk a little bit more about that? You talked a little bit about, you know, following their titers, you know, you know, we, we have already, we've always told them there's a really a paucity of data with regards to the long-term clinical history of that. And, I, and we think that's still an evolving story. Can you say a little bit more about that? And can you talk a little bit more about the challenge protocols you mentioned earlier and, and whether other centers are also doing that because there's also some potentially some concerns about the delayed reactions and, and you know, when you're trying to you know, consider those types of challenge protocols. Yeah, that's a good question. And we're hoping to add to the literature um, soon with the sort of longer term side of it. But I think roughly about 30% of my patients, 30 to 40% probably, if you look at like a three to five year time horizon, they tend to resolve. Um, they equally tend to be patients that are not significantly outdoors, at least in terms of, you know, hiking or farming or hunting, et cetera. Um, so it, it seems like those who get additional tick bites, this really could be a, a long-term thing. Um, I think it's really important to, if you can avoid additional bites, that seems to be the recipe for trying to get it to go away. Um, in terms of uh, challenges, I have to tell you, we do fewer challenges now than we used to. Um, and some of that's just because over time, I think we've been able to, you know, get dairy back in the diet a little bit and then start to get a small amount of meat. And people, um, because the reactions are inconsistent, we tend to just sort of take a progressive approach often at home with very small exposures and um, over time just begin to put it back in their diet very gradually. But for patients who we do challenges with, um, I like to use pork sausage because it's fatty and they'll eat it in the morning. Um, and yeah, it's a long day because you try to feed them, you know, right at eight and then you're watching um, for six to eight hours. Um, and, and it, occasionally we'll have them walk the stairs, obviously with us, um, but just to try to augment it um, and really facilitate getting them to react if they're, if they're going to, or at least understanding if the challenge is negative, well, we try to, you know, a cofactor um, some. I, we have German colleagues who put people on exercise bikes, freedom and aspirin and a liter of beer and then pork sausage and, and really try to augment their, the challenges. So there are multiple ways, I think, to try to, to, try to really see if someone has true tolerance. Um, but in the end, even if you test, even if you pass the challenge, if you go out a week later and get tick bites, the whole thing could start again. Yeah, agreed. Um, I see another question. I'll, I'll just make one quick comment to Dr. Kruger's previous question about prevention, and, and maybe Scott, you, know, you, you do as well too, you know, given that meat is such a social cultural part of our diet here in Kentucky, you know, uh, you know, uh, substitution is important, you know, so getting them on something like 
beyond me or you know like one of those plant-based substitute yeah, you because know, back then uh, there'd been patients that be just non-compliant. They said we'll take the risk, and the, of course, against medical advice, uh, pre-medicate themselves and whatnot. They shouldn't, um, but it, it's happened. Uh, but uh, plant-based substitutes, I think, has been helpful in the last couple of years. Um, I see a question here from Dr. Murphy. I'll read it out, uh, Scott, if you haven't seen it. Why do you think nighttime symptoms are so common for this syndrome? particularly since so many of our patients eat mammalian meat during the day. I'm thinking about a lot about the patients who carry uh, diagnosed with fibromyalgia, with joint fatigue, and GI IBS syndromes. Curious what you think about testing for this alpha-gal allergy in these folks, uh, particularly in the primary care setting. Yeah, I think, gosh, we all struggle with fibromyalgia. So if you have an outdoorsy person who may have a history of bites and, and would test positive, and be willing to try two to three weeks of an avoidance diet, I think it'd be worth it um, just because I often feel um, like we run out of, of alternatives um, for, for helping those folks. So this could be a, you know, an interesting avenue in that sense to, to try to try. Um, in terms of the nighttime symptoms, I think in the US we often eat our largest meal in the evening at dinner, um, I think, we know fat content seems to be important, and so does uh, so does alcohol. So, you know, if, if you're more likely to have a hamburger and a beer in the evening as opposed to at lunch, it could be that that's a, a large part of why we tend to see these episodes um, at nighttime. I guess physiologically, you could say, well, our endogenous cortisol levels fall in the evening too, and so perhaps from an allergy side, that that might increase your risk. But I think it has more to do with um, the large meal at the end of the day, plus or minus um, maybe some some adult beverages. All right. Um, uh, I wonder if I could ask a question. Uh, to, to Stanley Levinson, you, you can hear me all right, huh? Okay, because, you know. Uh-oh, we might have lost but, the But just to go a little step further, uh, we used to, you know, do the testing, or we did the test, we do the testing for Lyme disease, uh, you know, there's a lot of, you talked about it's two-way, and of course a lot of Borrelia species can go in and other things like that. And I've seen some patients that uh, definitely had a tick bite, either they had a rash or actually had a negative for Lyme disease. Of course, they could have some other Borrelia that, that we can't identify. but. Uh, uh, various kinds of symptoms, and then they kind of get better. So, you know, uh, I wonder if you could comment on that, because I always just had the feeling a tick bite for some people uh, is just not very good. Yeah. Uh, you are breaking up a little bit, Stan, but I think the gist of what you're saying is very is true. There's a group of patients who get tick bites and they don't feel well. And I don't care whether it's infectious or allergic or what. My sense is that that's due to mast cells, that, that there's something about the tick saliva that activates mast cells. And we're actually working um, diligently on this because I find that patients get better on ketotophen and chromalin and a mast cell-based therapy um, and I think there's going to be more to come on it, but but your point is well taken that that not everyone who has a tick bite feels well afterward, and and I think there is something to that. All right, everybody, and I, uh, thank you, Dr. Levinson, and uh, one of uh, Dr. Krieger. I don't look like you're having some kind of glitch there. On are are you still with us? Yeah, I'm still here. I don't know if you can hear me. <laughs> I can hear. You. Okay, there you go. Okay, but. Uh, but uh, I just want to thank Dr. Uh, do you have any? Oh, well, first, did you anything you wanted to wrap up with Dr. Kruger? Or? I actually uh, want uh, Scott's uh, contact information because I think we, uh, and Aaron's question was very good. We probably are under diagnosing this in, in our clinics, and we could probably help at least that subset of real. Um, um, alpha-gal uh, population. So um, 
I, I would like to have his contact information. Maybe we can do some collaborative uh, studies with him. That'd be great. Yeah. And I've, I've got his email. Okay. <laughs> and thank right. you, Dr. And, Lee, for bringing him. Absolutely. Anytime. And uh, just one more thing before we wrap up, uh, Dr. Commons uh, at U of L for Medicine Grand Rounds, we have a little tradition for our uh, guest uh, of a gift for our guest speakers. Uh, we did this when we were in person, and we we've, we've continued through the virtual world as well. So uh, we are um, as a little gift from from Louisville to uh, to Chapel Hill. We're gonna you're gonna get your own uh, personalized Louisville Slugger bat. Wow, that's <laughs> awesome! Yeah, thank you. I'm excited. Uh, Thank you. Yeah, it's a, as I mentioned, it's a tradition we've had going back us. Uh, I guess I think Dr. Ro started with Dr. Jesse Roman uh, about several years ago, and we've continued it. Uh, but you will be getting this. Uh, I'll get I'll get in touch with you for uh, you know con uh, where you, you know shipping in from where you would prefer to have it shipped and that sort of thing. So, uh, but thank you, Dr. Lee, for an outstanding invite, and uh, Dr. Commons, thank you for an outstanding uh, outstanding talk. A lot of excellent feedback, and uh, we really do appreciate it. Oh, my pleasure. Thanks for the invitation. Glad to be with you all. Thank you. All right, thank, thank you. you. All right, and, thank uh, you. Thanks, else? Scott. Thanks, Jason, for helping organize. Oh, no problems. Great to see, always great to see you about the end of, about the, every year about the end of March. <laughs> every spring. Every spring. All right. Next time. Next and, uh, Thanks. Thanks, everyone.